Today we have Madhav Kandekar as our guest. Madhav Kandekar is an international reputed Canadian climatologist with an Indian background. He has published many articles in international peer-reviewed journals on the issue, especially focusing on the incidence and the frequency of extreme weather events such as Katrina, which destroyed a major part of New Orleans. He's visiting the Netherlands to deliver some lectures on climate change, or as it is often called, man-made global warming. <laughs> hey, you will lecture tomorrow at the University of Leiden. What will be your main message to the audience? I'm presenting a view of the science of climate change as I see it. My emphasis will be on the observational aspect of climate change. What I'll be talking in my presentation tomorrow is when we see the temperature structure, the observed temperature structure of the last 30, 40 years, then it becomes apparent that it, is, it does not match the CO2 increase. So it is probably induced by many other features, possibly large There's scale. There's no correlation between CO2 and temperature? There is no correlation between CO2 and temperature at all. In fact, if we look at the temperature change over the last 100 years and link it with the CO2, there is very little correlation. As I explained in my earlier discussion, from 1945 to 1977, the Earth's mean temperature declined by about 0.2 to 0.3 degrees, and that was the time the CO2 was increasing at the rapid uh, acceleration. In fact, soon after World War, CO2 was increasing uh, exponentially, and yet the temperature was declining. It was only in the last 30 years that CO2 and temperature seemed to show some sort of a correlation. But over a longer period, the correlation is very little. And since the beginning of this century? Since the beginning of the century, again, I think there were changes in temperature which was not correlated with CO2. And in fact, a recent paper by Willie Soon of Harvard Astrophysical Observatory in United States has shown that the Arctic basin temperature of last 125 years has a very strong correlation with solar or total solar irradiance, TSI as you call it, and very little correlation with CO2 changes. So there is the sun hypothesis again. There is again the sun hypothesis, you are right. Mm. Yes. You, you will reassure, I suppose, your audience tomorrow in the sense that uh, you will probably say there is no problem. Well, as yeah. I see it, the global warming that we are all debating today is an interesting scientific problem. But it is by no means a crisis. Global warming is no threat to humanity. I want to assure this again and again. So, climate policy then, what is the use of climate policy against the background of this view? I think this is a question that I cannot answer easily because there are a lot of political forces working at this point in time. What should be the climate policy must be debated openly. Just last week when I was in India, I attended a meeting organized by a group in New Delhi and I made my presentation and at the meeting some important government, Indian government officials were there and one Dr. Ahluwalia who is a deputy chairman of the India's planning commission, he made a very important statement that there is a need for a dialogue about what sort of climate policy should be ab adopted by world countries. And I think this is an important message. Is CO2 reduction or 
certain emission targets the only way to go? I do not think so. I think there are several ways we can deal with the climate change or as some people say, we, uh, combating climate change. I do not see climate change as a threat. We do not need to combat it. It is not some kind of an enemy. It is a gradual change and humans have a remarkable ability to adapt to extremes of climate which they have done in the past and I'm sure they will be able to do so and still be able to make significant progress in the next one or two or more decades to come. But since you started your work on models, I suppose that there has been considerable improvement in the quality of the models and the outcome of the models and the probability of the uh, predictions of the models or not? Oh, de definitely, definitely. In fact, uh, I, as I explained to you, I think the first, one of the first operational weather prediction model that was established in the United States was in 1963. And it was relatively a simple model. There were just three layers, one a surface layer, one middle atmosphere level around 500 millibar, and one layer around tropopause. Since then, numerical weather prediction has grown extensively. Today, weather prediction models employ something like 15 to 30 layers in the atmosphere, plus a few layers in the ocean, and they integrate very carefully for a period of one to three days to even seven days. Mm -hmm. And I think our skill in weather prediction, in weather, in defining major or synoptic scale weather events for up to seven days is reasonably good. 